Welcome back to Boring Reviews. Boring Land. Oh, just kidding. On. Blasphemer. Oh, Hello, my. Boring Review Nation. <laughs> we know all things. Hello, Boring Review Nation. Gabe. And Nick from Miyagi Do. That's right. We learn about balance. We learn about self defense, you bully. Listen, listen. I'm not sure how much balance your boy Daniel's son had there in season three, but we're what are here. What are you talking about? Oh, just, man, he's going to get me fired up right at the bat. I've he had a whole lot of balance in season three. Are you kidding me? Even his wife called him out, but we will get into that. Oh, shortly. my gosh. You weren't watching the story. All Ooh. right, guys. This is our review for season three. All right. Season three of Cobra Kai. Now, I got to say, uh, um, Cobra Kai is, is, you know what? Nick put me on to the show, first of all, Morris. I had no idea it had come back out. It had come out on YouTube. I was like, oh, man. And he did so because you see the gear, all right? Now it's popular to jump on the Cobra Kai train. But, Nick, how many people did you know other than me that was a Johnny Lawrence fan, all right? My team name has been Sweep the Leg in fantasy for how many years, bro? Just say it. Just now, say it. Let me tell you this. Johnny Lawrence... Um, most of the characters from the first Karate Kid, they fell into obscurity. They really did. They fell into that uh, media pop culture type thing from the 1980s. And we're going to be all over the place. I already know it in this review because we have no plan going into it. Like he said, me and Gabe are huge Karate Kid fans. We both have it in our top 10 films. This is my third favorite film of all time. I watch it all the time. We've had arguments and debates about Dan Russo and Johnny Lawrence. This is not going to be any different. Let me start off by saying... I love Johnny Lawrence in the Cobra Kai series, 100%. I guarantee when we had our heated debates later on this ep in this review, you're not going to think that. But I do. William Zabka is a revelation. It is, it is beyond words to talk about how not just successful this show is, but how well made this show is when they're rebooting characters in their – actors in their 50s 30 years later. This kind of stuff just doesn't happen. It just, it doesn't happen. The reboot, reboot 30 years later, they bring everyone on board. I want to give a whole lot of love right off the bat to the show creators, the guys who are super fans, bigger fans than me and Gabe, who have brought this to life. We're talking about John Hurwitz, Hayden Schlossberg, and Josh Hild. We also have some directors that have been doing the shows, Jennifer Saletta, Steve Pink, Michael Grossman, Lynn Oding, and Stephen K. Tushida. Hopefully I said your name correctly. But <laughs> these guys... I mean, this could have gone – everyone predicted this was going to go horribly. This was going to be a disaster. Yeah. No one wanted it. YouTube T YouTube Red said, okay, we'll take it on. But if you're watching this, you already know all that stuff. I just got to say, season three, when you finish watched it, and we're going to get into spoilers. It's going to be full spoilers, but we won't start with spoilers just yet. Without spoilers, Gabe, season three, when you finished it, and we both finished it in under 24 hours, what were your initial thoughts? Spoiler free masterpiece i think that you know very seldomly as seasons go on do they improve but season three is the best season by far now of course they had netflix behind them so maybe they had some better uh, uh, uh i think it was filmed before netflix bought it to tell you the truth was it filmed before Crazy. netflix yes i think so i mean not just the production value but the storytelling was amazing I mean, they nailed it, bro. They nailed it. And I am I, I, I am so excited. I'm upset that I now, like, have to wait. They said 2022. 2022 for the next one? Nah. Y'all got to get it done this year. Y'all got to get it done this year. I can't wait to 2022. What, are you kidding me? Oh, my gosh. But I'm so excited. And this show was amazing, man. I will say that unlike other shows, as they progress, they get a little bit worse and worse. This show got got better, and I, for, for sure, season three was my favorite, with the exception of a few little things here and there, a few little nitpicks, but man, I loved it. How about you? I feel the same exact way, and me and Gabe already know how we feel about because we text each other. I finished it last night, like at midnight or something like that. I had a vi I had a busy day yesterday. That's the crazy thing. I had a busy – I don't work five jobs like my man Gabe, the provider, but – I had a very, very busy day yesterday, and I was right when I got home, like at nine o'clock. I already watched five episodes. I told my wife, I'm sitting on this couch, I'm watching the next five. I gotta <laughs> check out what happens. And I loved every bit of it, every episode. The first episode, we'll get into our nitpicks later. The first episode was my least favorite episode in the entire season. 
This season, every episode got better and better and better. I absolutely had a huge smile on my face. I absolutely got pumped up with that last scene, and we'll get to that in a second. But I'm like you. I absolutely loved it. I have I have two good and one bad before we get into our spoiler talk. First good, like you said, this is the best season by far of this series, and that's saying a lot. And that's not just living in the moment. That's the absolute truth how I feel. The second thing, it set it up for an amazing season four. But my one bad is this, and, and these guys can do whatever they want. I'm worried that after, and I can, no spoilers yet, but after season four, where it's looks like it's heading, I'm worried that there may not be any more story for these characters. I'm worried that season four, and there's no way they would end it there with such the hype train it's on. I'm yeah. worried that season four might be the end of this amazing storyline that we've been going on since season yeah. two. Um, that's my fear. But guys, if you have not seen Cobra Kai, just know that me and Gabe absolutely loved it. I am so curious to see what other people feel. Last time I saw Rotten Tomatoes, 96%. So, I mean, that's a pretty good start. But Ooh. if you don't want spoilers, you got to leave right now. Come back after you watch the show because right now the spoiler shroud is lifted. It is all on Gabe. We have no type of formula for how we're going. We're not going to be able to do synopsis of every season or every episode. But why don't you? Why don't you do the best you can just to give us um, a summary of the big things that happen in this season? All right. So basically at the end of season two, Daniel's prize student, okay, who happens to be Johnny Loris's son, his arch nemesis, okay, ends up kicking my favorite character, okay? His real name is Cholo, but on the sh- uh, 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 <laughs> wow. I'm over here like, like gushing real. You know what I mean right now? Miguel. In the big high school fight, which by myself, by the by the way, that was my favorite uh, part of season two, that high school fight. He ends up kicking him over the balcony. Guy cracks his back. So now it's the repercussion, which is what I like. Like the real real repercussions of that would be, yes, it's gonna be on the news. There's gonna be some media backlash. And Daniel LaRusso, who's uh, become this huge auto dealer, right in the valley, and his whole uh, shtick is karate and kicking the competition has got a lot of it because his daughter was in the middle of the fight. She was the one that started it. And, oh, I just got to uh, poke the bear with Nick because he even texted me the minute he saw it. Like six minutes into the episode, one of the arguments you hear the entire time for people like me that love Cobra Kai and love Johnny Lawrence specifically, was like, that's not how I heard it, LaRusso, because he's trying to blame Johnny Lawrence. He's like, that's not how I heard it, LaRusso. You were the bully when you were in high school. Like, oh, and it was for the first time it dawned on him that, you know, maybe I did something to contribute to it, obviously. There's always two sides to the story because you kind of saw him sit down where he didn't expect it. With that being said, all right, his business is going through an issue. Robbie King's on the run. He ends up um, teaming up with Johnny. And one of the funniest parts, I, I love that part about season, about episode one. They got like the buddy cop thing going on or whatever, the Tango and Cash, as his wife said. He's like, no, nah, those are narcotics officers. We're not like Tango and Cash. Like, yeah, you guys aren't cops. It was so funny, that, <laughs> that, that interaction. But they try to find Robbie because he's on the run before the cops find him so he could turn himself in because, again, he committed a crime. He's going to go to juvie. And luckily, Daniel gets the cops there. But before he gets to explain to Robbie what he did, Robbie gets upset. So now Robbie, you know, has is at odds with both his sensei, okay, and with his dad. He, he feels like he's on his own. He's in juvie now. Okay, he gets locked up, but it was the best course of action. It was the best course of action for him. Anyway, to make a long story or short, to continue progressing the story. All right, Daniel's in trouble because his competitor uh, has seized on this to try to buy his dealership. He's made a deal with Dayono, who is the main distributor and manufacturer of the cars Daniel sells, the Japanese cars that Daniel sells, to cut him out. Like, you don't want this kind of bad publicity or whatever. So Daniel now has to try. Did it sound like they were saying Toyota? Yeah, like, Doyota. Doyota. I thought they were saying Toyota. It was very clever how they had a name Doyona. That sounds like just it. like it. I like that. I like that. So <laughs> basically, Daniel now has to travel to Japan in order to ch- make the deal with Diona. Diona. Um, they don't want anything to do with him. They said, listen, we understand your sales, and we just don't want the bad marketing. We don't want the bad press. We can't be associated with you. So just talking to a bartender, the bartender explains to him, sometimes, you know, you got to go back to the beginning and in order to, you know, speak to our ancestors, you, you got to go to where it started. So he goes back to Okinawa, right? He goes mm-hmm. back to Mr. Miyagi's uh, small town, which is now modernized, but two people from his past, or three people actually, are still really relevant in the town. I cannot remember her name. The... Mm-hmm. 
Kumiko. Kumiko. Yeah, Kumiko. She's still dancing. She's back at the town. He's she's the first person she meets. They start hashing up, you know, uh, uh not hashing up or kindling rekindling relationship, but you know, kind of just talking, catching up. He explains his business is in trouble because of what's cap going on. You know, he opens up to her. So she says, Yeah, you know, you need to kind of go on self-discovery. And, 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 and uh part of that would be to meet with this person, chosen. So it's funny because as soon as he sees Chosen, he's like, oh, my gosh, Chosen. So and this man tried to kill me. I don't want to talk to him. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And like he, he said, listen, that was long- <laughs> yeah, exactly. He tried to kill me. He tried to kill you. It's like that was a long time ago. Forgiveness, as Mr. Miyagi showed him, you know, he forgave his rival. Danny had Daniel had never learned to forgive. And I think that was the biggest thing for this year or this episode, his arc, learning to forgive in order to really learn those Miyagi. Oh, teachings. like Johnny yeah. learned to forgive, right? Like no, Johnny, Johnny has that either. Johnny's still flawed, but uh, uh, I think that that was the arc they were going with him anyway. So Chosen, at first you don't even know what, what, what side Chosen is on because he's all stone-faced or whatever. Chosen says, you know, you got to uh, 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 learn real Miyagi-Do karate because he's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, my, your master taught my master who taught me. So they go sparring and Chosen lets Danny have it. Yo, he, listen, he rocked his snack box, bro. Rock this snack box. Okay, let and me he- and let me interject real quick. Just a few thoughts here about this because I love the whole chosen thing. I absolutely loved every minute. I thought they had a perfect amount of his character in there. Um, I thought it was very worthwhile. I'll let you get into the lessons that he taught him. But what I I've got to say is I hate Karate Kid Three with a passion because they make Daniel so weak. They make him not. And I get it, the fear thing. And they had a great job of connecting that in this year se- in this season. If you can make Karate Kid 3 look a little better, you're really doing something, these show creators. And they were able to do that. But he was so weak, he couldn't do anything against Mike Barnes. And I always hated that. Like, this guy just fought to the death in the second one. And after that, he can't even throw a punch. And so I like, in the Cobra Kai series, being a huge Daniel Russo fan, I like how they don't make him weak. Like, he can throw down with the better of them. He can throw down with John Lawrence. He can throw down with Kreese. He can throw down with anyone. And even with Chosen, when Chosen was showing him something, because Chosen, this guy was an amazing martial artist in Karate Kid 2. So I liked how Daniel was learning from some of his own mistakes when they were sparring, and it wasn't like he was just getting destroyed the entire time. He was throwing down to the point where he almost had the upper hand, and then we get the great lesson from Chosen. Yeah, but even when uh, Danny has banged out with Johnny, they've evened out, right? Basically, you know what I mean. Like none of them are, are better than anyone. So and that's far, what I like first- about it because you look at you look at William Zabka and you look at um, um, Ralph Macchio, right? right? Zabka looks like the obvious, you know, clear cut favorite to win that fight. John right. Lawrence was in Karate Kid, and Daniel Russo is trying to learn things. But I love in this because in this in this series they do such a great job of making things seem more realistic. You know, give credit to these actors. These guys are in their 50s, and they're throwing down. I'm sure they have stunt doubles, obviously, but they're doing a lot of their own stunts. And they make it so believable to where you believe that, okay, Daniel Russo did learn karate from Miyagi, and he can defend himself. I just, I, as a Daniel Russo fan, I love that. So Chosen explains to him, listen, the reason I beat you is because you really don't know all Miyagi-Do karate. Because, you know, Mr. Miyagi, like him, like, for whatever reason, he, he morphed the morphed it to what we all know karate kid to be or miyagi do karate to be karate is for defense only and chosen is like no you know we also have an offensive side why mr miyagi changed that i don't know maybe they'll change that they'll, they'll expose that in the future i have some theories as to why he changed it you know part of it being the trauma of war losing his wife you know what i mean him wanted to be peaceful at this point but he completely took out the offensive side of it and now chosen showed uh daniel's son the, the offensive side of Miyagi Do Karate, which well, if it was if you good remember before, in the Karate Kid series, especially the first movie, the second movie. In the first movie, Daniel's always asking, When can I learn to punch? When can I learn to punch? And he says that, um, he says, You first got to learn to fly, you got to learn balance. All that stuff will come later. He was not concerned about the offensive, he was concerned about the balance, he was concerned about understanding it because Daniel Russo is a hothead, he is emotional. He is That's- quick to judgment. And so Miyagi knows him so well that he never really wanted to get him to that point. But in the third movie, the one I hate so much, at the very end when Dan Russo is just frozen with a panic attack, he says, your best karate still inside. Now it's time for you to do something. It's time for you to let it out. Anyways, I just, I love this so much. That was my theory. Like Miyagi didn't oh, teach him. 
because no, but you, but you, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it because he knows Daniel Russo still has some growing to do because he was a hothead. You know what I mean? And you don't want to make somebody an offensive weapon if they're a hothead like that. Anyways, to continue on to the story, that goes through the the chosen uh, um, uh, storyline. Well, don't the- forget the greatest thing. I'm sorry because it's hard to summarize, summarize when someone keeps interrupting you. But the biggest thing he says is that this part of offensive is not really like an attacking thing. It's how to prevent the other person from waging war on you. Take right. away their best things that they have in that war. And in this sense, the pressure points to numb out the arms so the guy can't punch you for a few minutes. And even right. that is so self-defense anyways that right. I just love that they out, they in, they put in this new element of Miyagi-Do that looks more offensive, but it also has that defensive part of it. Correct. Now, on the same, uh, at the same time, his daughter is ostracized at school because like, even like she said, it's not like when boys get into a fight. When a girl gets into a fight, even if you win, they think you're crazy. So she's ostracized at school, okay? Tori got expelled. Miguel's in the hospital. And at the very end of season two, Johnny Lawrence actually ends up sneaking into the hospital by cracking his head on his own head open so he can get into the ER, go see Miguel, and it's he that snaps Miguel out of the coma. We find out Miguel's been in a coma for about two weeks now or whatnot. So Johnny uh, um snaps him out. He didn't get to see that, but that's the actually the episode, end of episode one when Miguel wakes up. Anyways, Hawk is still. At it again. I love Hawk's character. He's one of my favorite characters or whatnot. He's become the top dog at uh at Cobra Kai, basically. Now that Miguel is down or whatnot. And for the most of the season, he is running around like a bully, but you start seeing some uh, 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 a couple chinks of the armor armor where he's even questioning, you know, his own sensei. When his sensei, and we'll talk about Kreese later, starts kicking out people who've been loyal to Cobra Kai for silly things like they don't want to feed a mouse to a cobra. So everybody gets the best out. of the best. He wants he the toughest. Wants the best of the best, exactly. And he's like, you start seeing, I think that's where he started losing, um, where he started losing Hawk to me when he started doing things like that and put and picking out these guys who've been loyal to Cobra Kai. Their only flaw is that, yeah, they may be weak or they may be still a geek or, you know, whatever. So um, to make a, uh, that's that storyline. I'm trying to keep all the storylines. Miguel, well, one of the biggest things with Cobra Kai, Crease is taken over. Right. Like John Lawrence has given up on. It. I think we see it at the end of season two, but we definitely know full force that John Lawrence does not go back to Cobra Kai in the entire se- uh, season, which is crazy because Crease every time he shows up, oh, you finally made the right choice. We're going to take you back. We're going to welcome yeah. you back. But Lawrence does not go back, so that's a huge part right there. You you hit you you hit a lot of the things. You know, it was all about this season's a lot of Daniel and going back. There's a lot of Karate Kid two nods, a lot of Karate Kid three nods. Him trying to understand him because he he is just as much to blame as Johnny, if not more so, in all this full out war that's going on. Johnny's biggest flaw is allowing Crease to creep back in when he should have known from his better judgment. Um, you got the Robbie thing where he's being approached by Crease and trying to be, you know, turned to the dark side because you know uh Daniel turned on you, turned you to the cops, and Johnny's never there for you. Johnny cares more about Miguel. Miguel is rehabilitating this whole time where he's learning to walk a lot, all the help to Johnny. Really? He's learning to stand. He's learning to walk. He's learning to fight a little bit back, but Johnny wants to protect him. You got Johnny and his whole love story with uh, Miguel's mom. And then you got Allie Mills at the end, which was fantastic. There's so much going on. We're not going to be able to bring all of it together. What, before we start sharing our thoughts about this or that, and before we start bickering and arguing like a married couple, what are some other parts of the synopsis that you still want to, you know, reveal real quick? You know, for me, I think that that the the, the other important storylines is jo- Johnny's relationship, where he realizes that it's his fault that Miguel got hurt, and for starting Cobra Kai, and his flaw is that because his sensei showed no mercy he knew that that was the wrong mentality so he even tried to show mercy to crease right at that very first fight they had at the end of season two uh, at the beginning of season one i should say of season two i should say he showed crease mercy then he let crease come back into the dojo in season two even though everybody knew he shouldn't have done it and crease is a snake he taught his student to show mercy and uh, 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 Miguel showed mercy. He got kicked off a balcony. And Miguel even says, I did everything you taught me. I did everything you taught me, and I showed mercy, and, and why did this happen to me? And Johnny says, I don't know. Well, later on, 
he is met with his friend who's a, a, a pastor of a church. And Spencer said, Johnny, you do the right thing, not um, because it works out, but because it's the right thing to do. Just because you did the right thing doesn't mean it's going to work out. And I think that that finally got through to Johnny because even after I started questioning, like, man, the guy's showing mercy and, and, and this keeps going wrong. But it's a bigger overarching story of that or, or, or you know, that old adage of, you know, uh, the true measure of a man is in what they would do if they knew they would not be found out. You know what I mean? It's doing the right thing when other people aren't looking, not because you want a reward or because you want the oculates, but just because it's the right thing to do. And I thought that that was an important little story arc that they put there for Johnny, because I was like, man, he's going to turn back to the dark side to crease. He never does. He opens up Eagle Fan Karate. Gosh, please don't make me have to get an Eagle Fan Karate. Worst name ever. First of all, Eagles do not have fangs, all right? Like one of the kids pointed out. Eagle Fan Karate, and then you got Eagle Fan Karate and Miyagi Do, who are now gonna have to get together to to take on the new Cobra Kai. Cause uh, uh, Kreese, after he kicked out the weaklings, like he said, he went and recruited all the bad kids from the neighborhood. The all oh, the the Asian kid that's the wrestler who was the big bully from season one. I forget. Did they his. reveal that he was a wrestler in the first season, or did they kind of yeah. just give him that? No, no, no. Because he was talking to um um. To, to Johnny and Johnny said, "What happened to your face?" And he was like, "Oh, uh, just a, a wrestling match. Remember, it was a His throw." His name was Kyler. Kyler. His name was Kyler. Kyler. Yeah, Kyler goes. Oh, it was an injury from a wrestling match when he has the injuries after Johnny beat him down or whatever. He he mentions, "Oh, if it was from a wrestling match, it's just a throwaway line." But yeah, he's a wrestler, so he recruits athletes, brings them into Cobra Kai, and he has these untrained athletes taking on his Cobra Kai. If you lose, you're out. So Kyler gets a, a beat down i forget who it is uh, on there oh um uh behind face we're gonna give him the name behind face or whatever he beats him down he gets kicked out like crease is showing how ruthless he is so i'm like all right whatever then you got uh uh you know cobra kai guys that like like tori who can bang out she bangs out with whoever he brings her because he's got some really good athletes in there and then it's hawk's turn in my favorite scene of this season for hawk He's like, no, no, I want to go next because this is one of his bullies, one of his tormentors. And he's like, I'm going to get this guy out of here. And he beats the bricks off of him. This is the most violent thing. This episode, this season for Hawk was so crazy because he beats the bricks off of this kid. Earlier, he breaks his own friend's arm, right? That was a gruesome scene. I was like, oh, and Daniel's daughter is hiding. She led them there to battle and then she's hiding because yeah, she's afraid. Yeah. All right. So he Oh my gosh, he just snaps him. Not Eli. Eli is the Hawks real name. I always forget his other Dimitri. Dimitri's arm breaks it like a twig. I'm like, oh my gosh, Hawk has really become the big bad this season. But then at the end, like I said, he had that arc where he realizes, oh well, if we kicked out all the other good kids, and he comes back because he does love Dimitri. And they're about to break Dimitri's arm again at the very end. And he steps in, and that's when he becomes Team Miyagi Do slash. You know, Cobra family, uh, Eagle, Eagle family, family, whatever it is. You know the, what name, the name's got to die. The name's got to you know, die. The name's got to die. You talked, about, you talked about Joey Lo or Johnny Lawrence's, uh, the lesson he was learn learning. And this show, it illustrates the fact that when you start a war with someone, 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 nothing good happens. People just end up dying. And that's what Miyagi Do and Cobra Kai in the first two seasons were doing. They were just, when we got that fight, the high school, they were, Increasing that war men, the more like mentality. Miyagi Do's whole thing, I, I get it, it's a made up dojo, but Miyagi Do's philosophy is self defense. If you think about it, if you just continue to defend yourself and don't try to antagonize and don't try to attack and don't try to stir things up, if you just defend yourself, you're never going to start a war that way. You're going to protect yourself and those that you are protecting, but you're, it's never going to get any worse. And I think that's Miyagi's whole mentality. Daniel never truly learns that because as an adult, he gets he gets his ego hurt, his pride hurt because of Johnny. He still turns back into that 17, 16-year-old kid that got his butt kicked time and time again. And so he hasn't learned that message of just defending. But you're right. In real life, when you do what's right, you still have bad things that happen to you because that's just the way things are. There, there's so much to talk about, and I don't want to spend too much more time in this review doing synopsis. I wanted to have a discussion with you about one points. more storyline, the Cree sure. storyline. Uh, and, and not to interrupt you, but you asked me which one I thought was important. The Cree storyline I thought was super important. And here's why. 
in the very first Karate Kid, they just made him out to be the super bad guy. Like, oh, and even in Karate Kid 3, you know, they try to kind of make him a sympathetic character, but ultimately he went to get to Terry Silver to get help to destroy Danielson and, and Mr. Miyagi, but they never gave him a motivation for why he's bad. You find out that Kreese's mom killed herself, okay? So he's already dealing with those demons as a kid, uh, all right? Oh, not a kid, but a young adult, 18, 19, probably. He joins the military, and his platoon leader... Okay, who's a psychopath, who's the guy that, who looks like who taught him karate at that point or whatever, after they get captured because Kreese is unwilling to sacrifice. It might have been Terry Silver, too, who was planning the bomb when they were doing, like, the night raid or whatever, the, the special squadron. He was not going to kill one of his own men while his captain was, like, blow it or we're all dead. So since he didn't blow it, all of them got captured, and that had to be on Kreese's conscience that, man— for me, showing mercy to Terry Silver and for me not blowing it at that point, all these guys came out and captured our whole platoon. And so far, I've seen four or five of my 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 brethren, my 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 commandos in arms die because of my choice. And even his com- com- um, platoon commander said, you're right about one thing. This is all your fault. All those deaths are on your fault. So that's got to be weighing on them. So he 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 fights his captain in place of Terry Silver. We find out why Terry Silver owns owes him so much or whatever because he wants to, the captain and Terry Silver get put in a fight to the death. That's how this uh, it's in Vietnam, right? In Vietnam, I think Korea. Korea, yeah, they well, got no, them. Vietnam. I don't know. It was probably Vietnam. Vietnam. They got this fight to the death where if you fall off this, uh, they get th- or thrown off of this little bridge. There's a pit full of snakes and you die. Well. He volunteers to go in the place of Terry Silver, who at the at this point is scared to death, doesn't want to go and fight the captain or whatnot. And he goes and he wins the fight with the captain. But just as he's about to, the captain's about to fall off because he's hanging off the side. Here comes the Green Berets and uh, the, the Air Force or whoever, and they storm the base so they're saved. But he goes too far. And this is where that revenge part comes in where there was no reason for him to kill his captain other than the fact that he know his captain would have killed him or would have killed Terry Silver. So his whole mentality is kill or be killed. He killed his captain. That's cold-blooded murder. And now you know why he is the way he is. I thought that was such an important storyline because now Kreese no longer becomes just this, this monster. You see that there's a, there's a line that's important where he says himself to his students, guys, understand that in every story, the villain, he's trying to point and put Miyagi Do as the villain. The villains always think they're the hero of their own stories. In their eyes, they're doing what's right. Well, that's his own mentality. In his eyes, he's doing what's right. And I thought that was so important. I know we disagree about that, but that's the last storyline I wanted to touch. Sorry to interrupt you, my friend. Go ahead and pick up. So let's just talk about that. I There's about three or four things I don't like in the entire season which is not that much because this season is fantastic. And one of them for me was that, that storyline. It, it, from a writer's perspective, from a building of characters perspective, for me, it doesn't make sense. That storyline, I appreciate that they went after it, but if I have one nitpick about these showrunners is they are much more like you than me. When they see karate kid, they are so much more of vindicating the villain. That is a huge theme that we have in every season of this show. That's why it's called Cobra Kai. It's about Johnny Lawrence. Let's humanize and let's vindicate the villain. Let's make them the true hero. And it all stems back to that argument of who's the real bully. And if if, if we're all being honest, if I can use words from your own mouth, you don't even believe that Johnny's not the bully. Give me a break. But they, they love that whole thing. And so now they're taking... To, in my opinion, an unredeemable character like Kreese, who's one of those characters that you have in, in shows and movies who just has no humanity whatsoever. He is just all about stirring the pot and all about just pure evil. He has no loyalty to his Cobra Kai's, so you can't even say that's a redeeming quality. The thing where that, that background story does not make sense to me is maybe that's the beginning, but it doesn't fully explain to why he is so evil the way he is right now. because. He, you know, he showed mercy to his fellow comrades. And I think the guy that messed up with the bomb, I think he was the one that was shot in the head by the Vietnamese a few minutes later. I don't think it was Terry Silver, but I'm not exactly sure. But he shows mercy to Terry Silver. He doesn't, I don't think he wants to kill the captain, but the captain kept telling him, you got to kill, you got to kill, you got to kill. And so the captain's words came back onto him in a bad way. And he says, I'm going to remember that lesson. I'm not going to show you mercy 
to me, that was like, in my opinion, that was more of him, yes, going to the dark side. It was cold blood murder, but that was him teaching a lesson to the captain as he's going down to his death. To me, he still has humanity. He opens up the gate for his comrades. Come on, guy, come out. He hugs Terry Silver. If he is that evil crease guy, I can see him pushing Terry and Silver off and saying, get away from me. You almost killed me. You didn't. You sh I showed mercy to you, and it almost ended my life. He still has humanity. He's a good kid when he's working at the diner before he gets drafted. He's a good kid when he joins. He's trying to become the Green Beret and all that kind of stuff. To me, I don't feel like all the time we spent in that storyline for me fully explained. They try to humanize him. They try to make us feel like, okay, this is the kind of character he's in. But for me, I didn't truly buy it because they also made Kreese so evil. For example, yeah. Hawk, who I, again, Hawk can sit there. He can start fights. He can break into people's homes and destroy their property. He Still can break right. people's arms. He can steal property from golf and stuff. He can do all these horrible things, almost kill a kid with his fist. But because he decides at the end to save Dimitri, which was a great scene, I love seeing him do like the whole Jackie Chan and Chris Tucker thing where they were fighting back to back. Um, for me, this show, it forgives too easily. Forgiveness is a, is a good thing, but you have to have restitution. Hawk has had no consequences for his actions whatsoever. Even at the end, El or, uh, Dimitri forgives him right away. And by the way, if we don't mention it yet, Dimitri is a great character. Fantastic job by that actor. I love that character. You but got the best line in all of Cobra Kai, by the way. We'll get the to that in a second. But on my, to finish my thought on Kreese, Hawk shows you he has humanity. I don't forgive him for all the things he does, but at least he made the right decision at the end. But this guy, he shows some humanity. Chris shows no humanity. So for me, with that backstory, it's just like Anakin and the prequels going from Anakin, who still has some humanity, right to this evil Darth Vader who's all about power. To me, there's still kind of a jump there that I don't understand, but it's such a small thing. I don't want to spend another five minutes on it. Um, but yeah, Dimitri's fantastic. He's had quite the gain as far as a character. I love seeing him make out with Yas. That was so awesome. Even though she's like, oh, gross, get away from me. But what's the great line that he had? So in season, here's why I like Dimitri. Because he's comic relief, but yeah. he's what real kids would do. Like, he's like... The, the only level-headed person here, he said, well, Johnny Lawrence is like, what are you going to do if somebody comes into the street and hits you? He said, call the police. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and it comes out sarcastic, but the kid is, you know, I love how smart he is. So after, in season one, after uh, uh, he gets like knocked down on the ground or whatever, because John, because he's making those smart comments, when he first tries to join Cobra Kai, right? At the next day at school, he's talking to Miguel. Miguel's trying to convince him to come back. He said, I got yelled at, I got beat up, and then I gave him my money. You know who else lives like that? Hookers. <laughs> that is the best line in all Cobra Kai. Just the way he delivers it, man. Control. This kid is out of He's a great actor. I, um, you know, I was glad that they showed even the fact this this year this um episode or this season that Hawk is way more skilled than he, than he is. And that, yeah, like Hawk says, it was a lucky kick. I wasn't expecting you to be able to defend yourself. It was more, I was surprised that you were able to defend yourself. But when I'm going to take you seriously, I'm way more skilled. Because I would say Hawk is the second most formidable person other than Miguel. And arguably the first right now, because Miguel is hurt. You know what I'm saying? So uh, Hawk showed this season for sure. Like, man, he's a... He probably could have taken Robbie, let's just say, in season one at the tournament if he wasn't such a hothead and got disqualified. You know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. The thing about Hawk is he was way more um, – the acting, in my opinion, in this season elevated tremendously from season two. My biggest complaint about season two was it was, it was cheesy at times. There was line deliveries that weren't too – Hawk was just way too over the top. And I thought, okay, that's just where they want that character – I love the way the actor who played Hawk, Jacob Bertrand, I love how he portrayed him. I thought he did a great job. Everyone did a fantastic job acting in this season. Um, but the thing with Hawk is he's that prototypical guy who was bullied and becomes the bully and thrives on that power because he knows how horrible – he never wants to go back to being bullied again. He knows how horrible it felt. And it was crazy of Dimitri where he starts talking about the bedwetting and whatnot and calling him out because that ticked off Hawk even more. So, I mean, you had back and forth there. 
it's interesting in this show, and you realize it in the final episode that a lot of these characters they have like that enemy co friend type situation. You have Buttface and you have Chris, right? They go back and forth. You have the two young kids. The guy's like, I wouldn't show up to your funeral if you died. <laughs> <laughs> funny line. Yeah, no. You uh, have obviously Daniel and Johnny. You have all these different, you know, yin and yang type characters where it's so fantastic. One of my favorite things about this season was, of course, Daniel and Johnny. These guys, the, the actors have great chemistry. Um, the characters have great chemistry. They are they get so close to finally making amends, and then something blows it up. Very similar to Johnny and Robbie as well. But they get so close. But episode two, was that not the coolest episode where they are fighting back to back in that, you know, that car mechanic mechanic shop or whatever? Hey. And they were kicking butt the whole tango and cat. I mean, that episode was fantastic. I love that episode. And I'm telling you right now, their chemistry, I think season four, I'm so excited for them because you're finally going to see them on the same page. Oh, it's going to go down. Happen. And yes, they have so much chemistry together. They're so much fun. I love when they're in the car and the wife calls Johnny. His acting and the way they write him is so funny because he turns on on Ralph Macchio answers the phone on the uh, on the car phone and he's like, "Oh, hi, Amanda." He's like, "Just speak regularly, man." You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, little things like that that they write in when he takes the computer back to the car. He's like, take the computer back to the pawn shop. And he's like, the computer's fine. The batteries just died. The, 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 the batteries can't die. It's a recharge. He said, I thought you said it was wireless. He said, do you really not know what wireless is? <laughs> Little thing. <laughs> Out of control. Oh. And even when he tries to pawn the 93 Dodge Caravan, the guy's like, Kelly Blue, <laughs> it's worthless. Get out of here. I mean, Johnny is hilarious. He has, they do great writing with those moments that he has where he's just such a dinosaur. He has no idea what's going on. He's like, he's talking to that guy. He's like, this space is free. He's like, yeah, it's a public park. Can I go back to my family now? <laughs> I mean, Johnny is, he's fantastic. They almost still had him fall this season and he's still a flawed character. So I love his relationship with Miguel. And in season one, after Miguel gets beat up in a skeleton costume, he tells his mom, this is the only person in the world that believes in me. This kid is not giving up on me, and I don't want to give up on him. Just give me one more chance with him. He loves Miguel. Then why would you cross the line and go ahead and bet his mother? You know what I mean, dude? I, I feel like you crossed I the line. I saw it going a different way. I saw it going a different way. And they then didn't it even go went worse. the avenue I thought they were going to go. It went even worse because then they bring Allie, and he's about to kiss Allie. And I'm like, no. Did you, you not expect me. to see Carmen come around the corner like yes. 15 different times when he's oh. about to smooch her or he's hugging no. her no. or Miguel or something? I fully expected Miguel to because – and he's sitting there. He's excited about Allie, and I get it. Miguel 17. He doesn't want you shacking up with his mom. But once he finds out you did and then you're thinking that you're going on a date with Allie, I thought it was going to go so bad, but they, they, they just kind of avoided that. And right. it worked out to a way where I don't see it becoming an issue because um, Johnny himself – and I kind of appreciate they didn't go that way because it would be so easy. Johnny makes the decision himself. I do love Carmen. Yeah. You know, Allie's great. And Allie – let's talk about Allie for a second because I was waiting for Elizabeth Shue to show up. She is such a strong person in real life, but she's also a strong character in this show. And she she was that moral compass. She was that bridge, thank goodness, to finally get Johnny – and Daniel together because if you think about it they've had so many close calls but they could never get to see eye to eye it would have been so unbelievable any other way if it was Amanda or if it was Carmen it had to be someone like Allie who was that bridge who did she was both of their first love right, right. they mentioned that and she had to sit there and call them out like you guys are still fighting like really you guys have run into each other you guys have you threw a you drew a dick on his face you did this to his you, you sent your, your cousin to go beat him up with some goons or whatever to beat up his car. All this kind of stuff. She was such a great bridge. And it was so cool because when the whole conversation was done and, you know, there was no drama with the wife and Allie. They were totally cool about it. At the very end, when they're leaving the, the, the country club, you have Johnny saying, uh, Merry Christmas, Daniel. That was so cool. That was fantastic. And I think that that's what she served on, uh, served as that 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 bridge 
or or that peacemaker. And I think the most important thing was she showed them how they're both exactly alike. They're hot-headed dudes that normally are their own worst enemy because she explained uh, the story of really why her and Daniel broke up because he did exactly what Johnny did, all right? He jumped to assumptions. He got super, super jealous or whatever. Now, he didn't go as far as Johnny where he assaulted the guy or whatever, where Johnny did push, you know, um, Ralph with the rake. But he just showed that they're ultimately both hotheads, which Johnny is a hothead, and so is uh, uh, um. Uh, uh, I always call him Ralph Macchio, but on the show, his Daniel. name is Daniel son. And, you know, I think they first, they finally started to see things where maybe I wasn't always a hero in my own story and same thing because, you know, Johnny truly believes that was his girl. Like when he's talking, there's no reason for him to, to lie to um, um, Miguel. He loves Miguel. And he said, I thought we were just going to work it out. We had fought plenty of times before, you know, when he's, you know, that was his first love. He thought they were seriously going to get back together. So he sent showing it from you, from your perspective, he didn't realize that that relationship was long and done and over with way long before Daniel got there. In his mind, it was, oh, it's a little fight. We're going to get back together. He blames Daniel for the ending of the relationship. And Ali has said, you want to want me, want me to remind you how you were the worst boyfriend in the world and why we broke up? Like, oh, it wasn't Daniel. It was of my own doing. So, I, dude, they and wrote And that's the biggest book. flaw. That's the biggest flaw, in my opinion, about Daniel being the bully. And this show so much is pro, you know, vindicating the villain, right? They only give Daniel like a five-minute conversation with Miguel. And I love that conversation. Miguel's looking at the cars. Miguel's like, you're from Reseda too. He realizes they have so much in common. And in any other perfect world, they would have been, you know, student and teacher because they're so similar. There's so much alike. I mean, you could even talk about, you know, Ralph Macchio coming from Italian-American heritage and Miguel coming from Mexican-American heritage and the single mom. There's so much similarities there. And Miguel's like, but since they told me about how you were moving on his girl, he's like, I didn't even know who Johnny was. I was brand new. All I know was knew was there was this hot girl there, and she was giving me some attention. And I saw her saying she didn't want to be with this guy. This guy, she was telling the guy to go away, and I was trying to step in and help out. And I right. think that's the biggest key to what debunks the whole theory about Daniel being the bully is it's very obvious when you watch Karate Kid. Ali doesn't even have a second thought about Johnny. She is over Johnny. She is beyond right. Johnny. She is past him. It's not like we see in many, many shows – where the person is still kind of stringing Johnny along. No, it's 100% emphatic. No, get away from me. I understand Johnny. He can't get over it. He's got his Cobra Kai friends. And the great thing about this in season one, you get to know Johnny's story about how he was a poor kid too. He just His mom happened to rich, marry a rich guy. And for the first time in his life, he felt like he got some power with karate and with his friends. And all that's great. I just love at the end – when you have the Phil Collins song going, right? And you have Miyagi Do and Eagle Fang together at Miyagi's backyard. And you have that awesome slow music of Phil Collins. And you see Johnny Lawrence come out. You see Hawk come out. And they look at each other and they bow. It's fantastic. The thing I'm excited about with season four is you would say, like, they don't have much to work on. It's just the All-Valley Tournament. Oh, no. These guys don't mess around. They're going to give us 10 episodes of all gloriousness until we get to that final episode. Let me ask you this. Before I reveal my opinion, what did you feel about the absence of Aisha? Do you feel like we missed her in this season or we didn't miss her? I will tell you this. I was upset because the way they explained her absence was – and if I got one – complaint of the season it's like she was too big a character in the first two seasons for for the showrunners and producers just to give her one line like oh you know her parents got upset after the fight so they pulled her out of out of school and sold her house or sold their house that's it that's all we get she still got a phone right she would still communicate with her whole co co cobra kai uh, homies right I mean, you know what I mean? Like, like her best, you know, she loved Miguel. Her and Miguel was so tight. They were the first two students at Cobra Kai. You don't think she would have at least dropped the line and called Miguel, dropped the DM, something? Like, oh, my gosh, my homie's out of a coma. Like, that I, I did not like. I know that there was some other stuff that happened with her character in real life, which is why, you know, she didn't return to the show and there's, you know, other drama going on. I hope they bring her back because just like they brought back Kyler. Kyler wasn't really in season two, but they brought him back for season three because I did not like that. Um, but yeah, just on your short answer, I didn't like the, how they handled that. And that's my one complaint about season three. 
I feel like this season, as great as it was, I feel like it missed out on Aisha. Because look at all the new Cobra Kai's we had. You know, Tori, she's relatively new, too. She was new season two, um, you know, most of the season, but not all of it. Aisha, like you said, she's that OG Cobra Kai. She she is level-headed, but she also is emotional because she has been bullied in her life, too, and she can kick some serious butt. I feel like her character would have been so um, instrumental because you have Miguel, you have Hawk, and then you have Tori kind of on the outside as far as the original Cobra Kai's. If you had an Aisha in there who knows Samantha, who knows Miguel, like you said, who knows Hawk, that would have made things really, really interesting. She could have been a moral compass to Samantha. Um, I like how Daniel had that moment with Samantha because he had been so preoccupied with his stupid immature tantrums and Johnny Lawrence that it was good to have that connection. But I do think they missed out on Aisha. I try to look it up, Gabe, on why she really wasn't there. I could not find one thing on the internet about tweets that she had done or social media rumors I heard. All I heard was a showrunner said, you know, we have characters leave and come back. She should right. be back for season four. But obviously did, something had to happen. They didn't bring her back. And that was their explanation. She had some personal stuff going on. Like, I don't know if you lost, no, but she lost a whole bunch of weight or whatever. Um, and, you know, she she's very vocal on social media. She was with her boyfriend. Her boyfriend crashed her car. Turns out he didn't even have a license, something like that. So she had to pay for a whole bunch of, you know, uh, at one point, you know, she was almost broke. You know what I'm saying? So I think that there was just, again, negativity around her. And because of that, uh, of that big incident or whatever, I think he was like even DUI or speeding or something like that. It, it was a big deal that they didn't want to bring that onto the show. Cause maybe the showrunners were already thinking about, we got this work with Netflix to bring this into Netflix. Why do that? Because the kids of this show are the stars. It's made stars out of Cholo, which is Miguel's real name. People love him. So that's what I was I was told. You know, I could see a show saying, I just don't want to bring that negativity around us right now when we got a good thing going. Maybe that's why they didn't bring her back. If you guys know in the comment, you know, let us know. But I could definitely see that when an actor's personal life you know, has drama. Why do I want that drama associated with my show? Does that make sense? Yeah, but at the same time, you could also look at the other way and say, we are the stability this person has when they're going through a rough time. They're young. They've gotten some fame. Talk about weight loss. We only see him for like three seconds. Would you notice Daniel's son? Oh, yeah. He, he I mean, real and, good. He's, and he's super young too. Like, how does a kid that age just drop all that weight? Not that he was humongous, but I mean, he was, you know, kind of a chubby kid. Like, I was just like, that's her brother? Like, that's crazy. And he's not, like, he's not in this season at all, which is kind of lame. But I was going to say, is, is this the same actor? Is this the same kid? Yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. But it is the same kid. It is the same kid. Oh, man. I mean, again, we not. you guys got to watch it. One of the things I think they did as a genius is, even if you're not a Karate Kid fan, and I'll tell you, you know who watches this show with me now? Alex, my younger son. They give you so much flashbacks and so much uh, backstory of what happened this season. I mean, in the original Karate Kid, that even if you're just jumping into it now, you understand the story. Oh, Alex yeah. has never seen the Karate Kid or, you know, one, two or three or whatever. He might have seen the one with Will Smith and Will Smith's son or whatever, Jada Smith and um, uh, Jackie Chan. But you know what I mean? Like, like, like they've done such a great job of making this show that bridged generations and and, and you know, is now geared toward that younger audience, but still the geeks like us that that are the nostalgia that got the Cobra Kai appearing, apparel and Miyagi Don. Let me tell you guys something. Before this show became popular, I had my Cobra Kai shirt. Nick had his Miyagi Do uh, 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 shirt. We were fans, okay? So that's one of the things that I think they've done so masterful. I'm just waiting for season four. Netflix has done some great shows. Uh, from the Umbrella Academy. I mean, they know all the Daredevil stuff, all the Marvel stuff. Like, I can't wait to see what they're going to do with it now that they got the whole property. Nick, I'm ready to give it a, a, a grade. Not that it needs it, the way no. we've been gushing over well, it. Let me just mention a few things before we get to the grade because there's there's so many things that we're leaving out. Um, Some of my nitpicks. Let me just get to those real quick. I thought the whole Doyona um, aspect was, was kind of lame. I thought that there's no way would an international car company care about a high school fight. I'm sorry. They're just not going to care. They want to sell the cars. And if there's a number one dealer in the San Fernando Valley, they're going to give them those cars. 
They're not going to have some businessman, some American guy tell them who to sell and who not to sell to. I thought that was completely stupid. I didn't buy that whatsoever. Um, I didn't really like any of that whole aspect around that because that just created an element that Daniel had to save or whatever. And then the way they fixed it up. I love seeing the young actress that was in Karate Kid 2 come back and, oh, yeah, I just happened to be a VP of international sales and I can make it happen and all this kind of stuff. She would have known that Daniel LaRusso had a meeting with the company to talk about this kind of stuff if she was the VP of international. All that stuff was just it was cool. They brought her back. And maybe that's the only reason they did that. But I thought that was a weak storyline. They wouldn't have cared about that. I'm growing tired of the Robbie drama with Johnny Lawrence. I really, really am. He is a good character. They made him such a redeemable character in the first two seasons. They did. Yes, they did. Because he he got trained. He got trained by Daniel Russo in Miyagi Do. And he seemed, it, it seemed like it was more than just because he had the hots for Samantha. It seemed like he was actually enjoying what he was learning from that. And in this season, they just completely erased all of that. And they just made the drama with him. And I understand why they're doing that. They got to have some kind of drama there because now Johnny and Daniel have made up for the most part. You've got to have some kind of conflict there. But it doesn't, to me, I don't buy it whatsoever because of what he's been taught from Miyagi-Do. And he's been so against Cobra Kai, so against his dad that he's willing to join this crease guy. I mean, he's not an idiot. He has had father figures in the past fail him. He's not going to cling so quickly to crease. To me, I don't buy it at all. What are your thoughts? I told there's two characters, and funny enough, two characters I I hate on this show. And when I tell you, and that's again, you're doing a good job. If I'm kept, it, it, I think that's the 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 goal, obviously. And who are the two villains? You can even go on the internet, and there's a a, a whole bunch of you know theory shows that the two villains are Samantha, okay, Ralph, my uh, uh John, um Danielson's daughter, and Robbie. The two kids have become the two villains, all right? Now, we're getting their stories here. Mm-hmm. Here's what drives me crazy about Robbie. He was ready to throw down with his dad season one. You remember that? When um, Johnny finds out that Daniel C, he's oh, trying to fight his dad. And in this season, he finally does fight his dad. And his and his dad's all now, for the first time, being defense. He's not trying to fight Robbie. And first of all, who do you think you're tr- – you, you don't raise your hand to your father. Second of all, your father has has tried even when you messed up and you were out with Samantha and she got drunk, you went back over there. Your dad has always tried to rectify the situation with you and you take the first chance you get to like – you know what I mean? To to, to, to to I just don't understand that. I mean, dude, it, 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 it's – Samantha is one of the two main villains. I'll get to you there in a minute. I'll get to. I'll explain that oh, in a minute. My God. This is the garbage that I hate. Go ahead. I'll get, there, I'll get there in a minute. You know, as speaking from somebody who my, you know, I was raised by my stepfather. Okay, like I would have done anything as a kid to have a relationship with my real father. That just was never an option. You know what I mean? My dad was just whatever. It is what it is. You know what I'm saying? I just cannot see somebody who would want, who really wants a relationship with their father, behave that way, and it drives me crazy you know, uh, 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 that, that they've taken that story arc with him. And I'm like, all right, whatever. Like they're building him up to be the, 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 the big bad basically for season three. Let's just be real. Cause now he's with Cobra Kai. He already fought his own dad. You know, he tells him to get out of it at the end of the day. He's going to be their guy. Now, Samantha, why people don't like Samantha. If you look at Samantha's case, a lot of the things that had, that have happened, like the whole, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 Miguel and Robbie thing is because of her a immaturity, b her privilege. So, like, for go back to the car accident, right? She's such an innocent girl. They run into Johnny's car because they're out there. She didn't do the right thing. She didn't tell her parents. Absolutely, she didn't. She didn't. Okay, and yet, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, uh it, it, it was like. Her, once her parents found out what happened, they punished them, and she thought she, she it was unfair, even though, listen, you, what you did was a crime. The Aisha storyline, you turn on your friend because she's not the cool kid. I think that it's her privilege and that Danny has raised his kids the way where he's given them everything or whatever. These kids have no boundaries, and she's always playing the victim. Everybody has admitted their own fault, from Miguel 
who admitted their own fault to, okay, this was partly my fault. You know, I'm, I'm in here in this hospital to, to Daniel son admitting his own fault to, to, uh, um, Johnny LaRusso, you know, not Johnny LaRusso, uh, Johnny Lawrence. She's still trying to play the victim. And it's like, dude, look at your own fault. That high school fight doesn't happen. If you don't kiss another guy's, uh, uh, boyfriend, bottom line, you kiss another guy's boyfriend. So you don't give any blame to Tori whatsoever. who threw the first punch. I blame Tori as well. But what I'm saying is Do that- you not say a million times in this season that it was her fault that Dimitri got his hand cut off, that she froze, that it was her fault yeah. that these people were getting and, she didn't and, take any blame for that. She and, didn't say a million times it's her fault that Miguel's in the in in the hospital almost dead. Are and you that was right now? That was a, but that was a story arc for her for this season because the first two seasons they really made her out to be the spoiled rich girl that a uh, girl. What she about died. the other two girls that were in the car accident? You're not mentioning their the, oh, the, absolutely. The thing. It's it's so easy to find villains in the heroes, and it's your favorite thing to do, and it's a lot of people the internet's favorite thing to do to try to find villains in these heroes. It, it we have two adult males, right? right. Johnny and Daniel. They are the adults. They are the parents. They need to take the blame. You can sit there and say it's Johnny's fault that Robbie's the way he is because he didn't raise him nice. barely at all for 17 years for crying out loud. I, it Agreed. Just, it, 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 I'm not going to blame a 15-year-old girl for decisions that, that a 15-year-old girl is going to make when she likes two guys and they're giving her different attention and then they're messing around. I just think that the first two seasons, they really showed, like, there was not a lot of redeeming qualities about her. She always looked like that spoiled rich girl that got what she wanted. And then in this season, they made a concerted effort to kind of see her reflect on how a lot of this stuff has revolved around her, how it is her fault. And, you know, I I think that it wouldn't have done that if they themselves, the showrunners, hadn't realized, okay, maybe we have unintentionally made her, you know what I mean, Like, like, like the bad guy or whatever. I don't know. Maybe that's just my opinion because that was her story arc this season. Finally being able to say, okay, man, she admitted, she said, I was the one that took them over there and I got Dimitri's arm broke or whatever. I was like, are you kidding me? You're the one that was over there. Like, oh, let's get Cobra Kai. And she kept trying to bring people together. By the way, not that I think I could be a better writer, but wouldn't it have been better? The best part when you can't figure out how to get the two dojos together, Cobra Kai and Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. Eagle Fang. Who's the one person they could have bought for one episode at the very end to bridge the two teams together? Because she's got relationships on both sides. Aisha. Just saying, showrunners. Aisha. That would have been perfect for her. But, you know, dude, we all, you know, we I respect your opinion. I just think she's annoying and, and forget it. That's the, the Robbie. It bothers me. I know that they're going to try to redeem him because the whole thing about this entire, uh, um, this entire, uh, uh, and even Danny Russo says it, he says, you know, growing up, you know, there was always black and white, white, you know what I mean? Good guys and black, uh, good guys and bad guys. And, you know, there is no white and black. There is no good and bad. There's just a shade of gray. Everybody thinks they're the hero in their own story. Tori, I'm glad you brought up Tori. I hated her at first. I'm like, I hate this chick. But you find out, man, her mom's a dialysis. She's working two jobs. It looks like they this- humanize the villains. They love to do it. You know what I mean? You realize why she behaves. There's the always way an excuse for why someone beats up. She started a riot fight at a school that got a guy yeah. in the hospital. That's also but my thing. Because she's got a tough home situation, it's okay. I mean, come on. They're going to redeem Robbie at the very end, and it's all going to be kumbaya. There's got to be consequences. And she doesn't even take responsibility. They're blaming mm-hmm. me and you, Robbie. This is a joke. I shouldn't have a parole officer. This is ridiculous. We have to pay rent? I have to pay rent? So Kreese comes in, and he's going to threaten the super who – this guy owns the apartment building, right? He owns no, that's it. Not- and no, he's, no. Re- he's replacing the pipes or whatever. Give me a break. No, no, he's not. A, he's not an owner. He's just a super. He runs the building. Okay, so he's gonna have no problem going to his boss and saying, "Oh, we're not gonna accept rent from uh, this family anymore." He doesn't have that kind of power. He doesn't have that kind of power. He's just trying to, you know what I mean? Like he's a Please. scumbag, a sleaze bag. But I will say this. <laughs> I will say this though. I've been a, 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 a part actually of a big fight like that uh, at my old high school. There was a huge fight at my high school, bro. There's no way Robbie would have been the only one arrested, okay? I don't care if her mom's on dialysis or not. Of course, she would have been in, in juvie too because she assaulted somebody 100%. with a weapon, with a weapon. So that was kind of like nitpicky for me right there. Like once you use a weapon, 
all all bets are off or whatever. So the fact that they got they let her off so so light because her mom's at home on dialysis and she's the caretaker, I doubt and the judge would have done that. But who knows? I will say about Tori, Peyton List, who plays Tori, she's on a show called Jesse that my kids like to watch. And she plays a prissy little sister in that show. She did a great job. She was someone that I wouldn't want to mess with. I mean, she showed the power and the prowess. She got herself a little bulked up, it looked like. She did a great job from an actress point of view. I just can't stand the character that much. Oof. Well, Nick, we're going on an hour, even though we said we're going to keep this thing short. So, mm. doesn't even matter. I mean, at this point, guys, I'll give my grade. This thing is an A+. plus. I told Nick in a text message last night, and he said, really? I said, of a continuing story, whether it's a reboot or a, the best one, and I, including Star Wars, and I love Star Wars, okay? And uh, Die Hard, which, you know, as the installments came, like Die Hard 5, I was like, really? Now, excuse me, now they bring in Bruce Willis's son or whatever, or John McClane's son or whatever, and then his daughter, and I'm like, stop it. I'm telling you, they, 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 they've done the best here. I'd have taken a product that I loved from my childhood growing up and continuing the story I love these three seasons, man. I give this thing an A plus, an A plus. Even though it's got its small faults, I give it an A plus. I do not care. I love the show. I love the show. Well, I there was a comparison, or there was something that was similar to it that's been rebooted and that was successful. And I can't think of it right now. This just does not happen. How many studios try to reboot movie franchises and shows? It just doesn't happen. Will and Grace, maybe the closest thing they had a successful run a second time around. It just does not happen. Um, this show is fantastic. Easy A plus. And just in case anyone's curious, like, Nick, you really question him saying that? My question was when you mentioned Die Hard is one, like, who cares about Die Hard? Like, I love Die Hard, but they never really rebooted. They just kept continuing on with it was what I was trying to say. But right. the Star Wars one is a good one because they've tried to bring back Star Wars many times. They try to bring the shows, and this has done it right. There's, there's a whole lot of cheese in this show, but really not in season three. Season three is fantastic. There are some liberties they take where there's, like, no consequences – you break into someone's house and you have a full-on fight and vandalism. They're all getting arrested. Every single one of them, to your point. So, I mean, you know, they kind of take some liberties there. Fantastic show. Very entertaining. I have not binged a show in less than 24 hours a season, and I don't know how long. So, good on you. Guys, let us know what your thoughts are. If you stuck around the entire time, I want you to type in the phrase, Cobra Kai is awesome. Because I want to know who stuck around for the entire hour and two minutes. Thank you so much. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And until next time, Cobra Kai never dies. <laughs>